welcome to Bold and Blunt, and I'm your host, Cheryl Chung, giving you a Christian conservative view of today's news, politics, culture, and events. And today's show, Freedom Isn't Free. You know, it's a phrase that's slung about with frequency. We hear it all the time. Freedom isn't free. Freedom isn't free. But today's show, coming as it does, just about on the date of the Tiananmen Square massacre in China, and coming as it does when you consider what happened back on June 4th, 1989, and look at this current White House administration's view of China, can you say Hunter Biden? Anyhow, it just seems like a good topic to revisit and really look at freedom not being free and what we Americans, we patriotic, liberty loving Americans can do, could do, should do, in order to make sure that freedom stays in America for years to come. And before I get to that, heads up, Washington Times is giving a special deal for bold and blunt listeners. It is a 50% off deal for the digital version of the Washington Times for a full year. Just go to WashingtonTimes.com backslash Cheryl, type in your info, and boom, 50% off. You will have access to the digital platform of the commentaries, news, and podcasts put out by the great staff of the Washington Times for a full year. It's a deal you don't want to miss. And while you're at it, I would love if you would subscribe to my three times a week newsletter. It contains all my commentaries for all the, all the days of the week that I write. I write, 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 all day long, all night long. That's all I do is I write commentaries for the Washington Times. Not really. I also write books, too. But it contains all my commentaries for the Washington Times, plus my twice-weekly Bold and Blunt podcast. All you have to do is go to thewashingtontimes.com, find my name, either in the scroll down at the top banner or... Or you can just click on something that is written by me. Click on my name, the hyperlink there. Go to the bottom. Go to the bottom of the page, the bottom of the story, and there are some easy directions on how to sign up for my newsletter. Or if you just want my podcast, how to sign up just for my podcast. But get them in your inbox. Get them in your email. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Get them directly to you for lunchtime, and then arm yourself. Arm your arm yourself with the bullet points you need to fight this lying liars in the media, and the socialists that they bend over backwards to accommodate. You need to have some quick and easy bullet points to pull out. July Fourth is coming. You know you have a family member there who's a socialist. You know at that barbecue, that picnic, that July Fourth get together that there's some sulking, angry, outraged, anti-American family member who just wants to use the occasion to run down America and talk about how racist, how inherently racist America is. Well, wouldn't you like to be armed with a, a quick a quick bullet point to shoot back his or her way? That's what my newsletter will do. So, speaking of July 4th, freedom isn't free, and that is something that we remember around July 4th, but we're a month early. And I just thought, look back through history. What happened in history in June that shocked the world, that shocked the world in a way that made everybody in the world sit up and take notice and say, never again? Well, remember this? The noise of gunfire rose from all over the center of Peking. It was unremitting. On the streets leading down to the main road to Tiananmen Square, furious people stared in disbelief at the glow in the sky, listening to the sound of shots. Heading down the road was a hazardous business, but hundreds of people cheered as buses were set alight and army trucks caught fire too. They yelled and shouted, and then as troop lorries were seen moving down the road, there was gunfire from those lorries. They're firing on their own people. The Chinese troops, the communist Chinese troops firing on their own people. That's one of those things in history that everybody remembers where they were. 
when they saw those shocking images, when they heard those shocking reports. Everybody. It's like the OJ trial, right? Or JFK's shooting, the assassination of JFK. People remember. They remember where they were. That was from the BBC, BBC News. Let's listen in some more. Times ...to grasp that this army was launching into an unarmed civilian population as if charging into battle. From Tiananmen Square, the sound of gunfire sounded like a battle, but it was one-sided. A line of soldiers was strung out facing a huge crowd. The air was filled with shouts of fascists, stop killing. We were in the line facing the troops. They were about 250 yards away. Young people were singing the international to a background of gunfire. After hours of shooting and facing a line of troops, the crowd is still here. They're shouting, stop the killing and down with the government. Wow, so where were you? Where were you during that day? 1989, June, June 4th, 1989. That's China. That's communist China. This is the same communist China that Hunter Biden allegedly, reportedly, according to the New York Post, according to the New York Post disappearing news story from social media, the same communist China that Hunter Biden, the son of the president, has cozied up to. This is the same communist China that Joe Biden today, Joe Biden, from the New York Post again, a headline, Biden, China believes it will own America within the next 15 years. We'll own America. Our own president admits that. Our own president admits that. Our own president right now admits that while failing to pressure China on the roots of the Wuhan virus. Can we call it that now? It seems the mainstream media is finally picking up on that notion months and months after Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, was condemned for using that phrase. But anyhow, China is going to take over America within the next 15 years or so. That is according to President Joe Biden's assessment. Did you hear his speech? Did you hear his Memorial Day speech? Here's a clip from it where you can hear in his own words how he acknowledges that China has a goal of doing just that. You know, I sometimes get criticized for saying what I deeply believe, having done this for the bulk of my life. We're in a, we're in a battle between democracies and autocracies. The more complicated the world becomes, the more difficult it is for democracies to come together and reach consensus. I've spent more time with President Xi of China than any world leader has for 24 hours of private meetings with him, with just an interpreter, 17,000 miles traveling with him in China and here. He firmly believes that China, before the year 3035, is going to own America because autocracies can make quick decisions. But America is unique. All right, so that's Joe Biden's speech to American troops on Memorial Day. And the thing I want pointed out, the thing I want remembered about this, is that he acknowledges that China, China's number one goal is to take over America. And it has a plan to do that within just the next few years. So the question is, what is Joe Biden doing to stop this? Aside from making speeches, acknowledging that the threat is there, what is the Joe Biden administration doing to halt China's takeover? Because look, there's two kinds of takeovers. There's a takeover by force where the military attacks, like a Pearl Harbor type attack, right, that sweeps America's military into war, 
that sweeps us all into battle. And there's a softer, more insidious attack. And it's called a cultural takeover. And this is what China's doing. If China were going to swoop in and attack America right now, America's Second Amendment rights alone would ensure that China would fall. And China's not stupid. China knows that, right? So what does China do instead? China's communists go subtle. Listen to this headline from The Atlantic in October 2019. Chinese values are changing America. The piece goes on to say, what America didn't anticipate about China. For too long, policymakers ignored the possibility that China could transform the U.S. rather than the other way around. It's a good piece. It's a good essay. I'm going to quote from it a little bit. In the 1970s, when the United States reopened its relations with China, a pendulum swung. Americans reached into their toolkit. And surprise, the U.S. launched a second campaign to remake China in its image. So the United States was trying to change China, to evangelize China, make China a free market Christian nation. On January 24, 1980, I'm quoting again from the Atlanta, Atlantic, Congress granted most favored nation trading status to the communist regime, cutting tariffs on Chinese goods to the same rate offered to America's friends and allies. Isn't that special? Isn't that nice? Working with the communists, working hand in hand with the communists to bolster the communist economy. And then, then came 2001, when China was admitted to the World Trade Organization. Robert Rubin, Secretary of the Treasury under President Bill Clinton, told Congress that China's accession to the WTO would, and here's the quote, sow the seeds of freedom for China's 1.2 billion citizens. Why do leftists, why do liberals always think that just opening up economic opportunities for dictatorial governments, for communist regimes, will automatically make the countries free for all its citizens. I mean, all it does is basically enrich the pockets of the tyrants and gives them even more power to crack down on private citizens. I mean, did that work? Did China become a normal nation? No, no. And remember, that was just a short time after Tiananmen Square. I mean, the memory was still fresh. So fast forward a bit, and policymakers still, still think that by opening the doors of economic opportunity that U.S. relations with China will not just be normalized, but China will become a sort of second sister to America and sing the same freedom song as America. Not so. Remember this. I'm going to quote from The Atlantic again. So now we come to October 4th. Remember the tweets by Houston Rockets general manager, Daryl Morey, expressing support for pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. Underlying the firestorm caused by one opinion from one guy in Houston is a broader worry that what America considered its historical mission in China, bringing freeish markets that would lead to freer people, has failed. But not only that, I'm quoting still, even as policymakers fret that China's government immunized itself from the baleful influences of Western values, they see that it has begun to turn the tables and is exporting its ideology around the world. In short, here's, here's the money line. In short, China has become 
China has begun to shape and manage us, not the other way around. Think about that. China's influence in America is quietly, softly, maybe barely without some noticing, shaping how we Americans view liberty, how we Americans live our supposed free lives. Communists are working quietly behind the scene, pulling the strings. Back to the Atlantic. When Maury sent out a tweet that included an image saying, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong, China's government, China's communist government, remember, girded itself for a battle with the National Basketball Association. Do you guys remember this? It wasn't so long ago. State-owned television and the Chinese internet giant Tencent suspended broadcasts of preseason NBA games. A slew of Chinese companies announced that they were putting sponsorships with the league on hold. China's Central Television, Communist TV, right, issued a statement calling for severe limits on freedom of speech. And then there was a spokesman for the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs who suggested that he expected the NBA to follow the playbook of other corporations and kowtow. Here's the quote, he said. The NBA has been in cooperation with China for many years. It knows clearly in its heart what to say and what to do. If that quote isn't enough to make you sit up and take notice and say, what the freak? Who is China to tell us, America, how to behave, what to say, how to act? If that quote isn't enough, I don't know what would. But for those who are starting to sit up and take notice to how China's influence is steadily, quietly, but steadily influencing America, here's some more from The Atlantic. The NBA's playbook mirrored that of other organizations that have gotten sidewise with Beijing. Initially, it waffled. The NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, put out a statement supporting Maurice's freedom of speech, but in its Chinese language statements, the NBA sounded significantly more apologetic than in its English ones. This is a tried and true formula. Still quoting, still quoting from this piece, the Chinese language is the first level of encryption. Who cares if you sound spineless in Chinese when you're stalwart in English? What's worse, other leading voices in the NBA sought to muddy Silver's message. The prominent NBA coaches, Greg Popovich and Steve Kerr, dodged questions on the issue. Rocket star James Harden, rocket star Russell Westbrook who made considerable amount of money in China through the sales of merchandise and shoes, announced on Twitter, and here's the quote, we apologize, we love China. And then came LeBron James. He thought Maury wasn't, quote, educated, end quote, on the situation. This is how China is slowly, slowly, but steadily changing America's culture changing how Americans, free Americans, do business. Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, he spent months and months, years, trying to get into China, basically bending over backwards to assure the communists in China that he would still honor their own speech policies, meaning no speech, no speech, save those approved, by the Communist Party. And now, one of the latest headlines, early 2021 from Business Insider, Mark Zuckerberg is copying the tactics used by China's tech industry to try and beat China's tech industry. So, Zuckerberg, he's spoken out about the risks of Chinese apps, right? of the privacy infringements, of the surveillance infringements that can come. But now, basically, he's doing the same thing, according to this writer in Business Insider. The writer had Zuckerberg in 
2019, outed as telling his employers, one of the things that's especially notable about TikTok is, for a while, the internet landscape was kind of a bunch of internet companies that were primarily American companies. And then there was this parallel universe of Chinese companies that pretty much only were offering their services in China. TikTok, which is built by this company, Beijing ByteDance, is really the first consumer internet product built by one of the Chinese tech giants that is doing quite well around the world, end quote, right? So Zuckerberg apparently called that an interesting phenomenon. And in order to compete, now what he's doing, I'm going to quote right from this writer at Business Insider, Zuckerberg has decided to take a page out of China's books, unashamedly aping the most popular products produced by Facebook's competitors and passing them off as his own. More Chinese influence on how Americans do business, right? If you can't beat them, join them. Zuckerberg spent so much time trying to get into China with his own tech, with his own social media, only to be shut down. So now I guess he's jumped ship and he's adopted the principle, if you can't join them, beat them. Did you know Zuckerberg in 2015 at a White House dinner asked the Chinese president to give an honorary Chinese name to his unborn child, to his, his and his wife's unborn child? The Chinese president said no, but why? Why would any American citizen want a communist to give your own child, your own American child, an honorary name. That says a lot, doesn't it? Here's another influencing factor of China into America. Here's a letter written by former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Quote, over the last decade, the authoritarian government of the People's Republic of China has sent curriculum and PRC-trained teachers into hundreds of U.S. K-12 schools through a program called Confucius Classrooms, end quote. You've heard about it, right? How the Communist Party is trying to infiltrate America's school systems and not just trying to, that they have actually done so, that they're actually actively teaching American children to hate America and love communism. Of course, not so openly that you would be able to fight about it, right? It's a slow, subtle change. It's just a, 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 a swapping of American founding father greatness for American founding father racism. It's a slow change. But if your child is taught from age kindergarten all up through school that China is actually a great country filled with great people, and America is a country that has done a lot of evils in her time, then what are you going to believe? And here's a story from the Hindustan Times, February 10th, 2021. The headline, speaking of these Confucius Institutes, the headline goes like this. Joe Biden withdraws U.S. policy to track Chinese influence in American schools. Let me read from this piece. The rule, the rule that Joe Biden retracted, withdrew, the rule required American schools and universities to disclose their partnerships with Confucius Institutes. The Biden administration has withdrawn from that policy, which was Trump's policy, on tracking Chinese influence in U.S. schools and universities. It was reported initially by the Daily Caller. And in the Daily Caller report... It went like this. The Biden administration has quietly withdrawn from that proposed rule to the Department of Homeland Security. 
It was called Establishing Requirement for Student and Exchange Visitor Programs, Certified Schools, to Disclose Agreements with Confucius Institutes and Classrooms. The rule had required all these schools to alert whether they were imposing these policies, requiring these policies, offering these policies and programs to their students on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. Around 500 different schools, K-12 through schools in America, and another 65 colleges reportedly had a partnership with Confucius Institute U.S. Center, which was a U.S.-based affiliate of the Beijing-based Confucius Institute headquarters. And Joe Biden said, nope, we don't need to know that information. Freedom isn't free. It really isn't. Freedom requires an alert citizenry. It doesn't require simply a Second Amendment so you can take up arms against encroaching dangers, against threats to home and safety and homeland and families. It requires an informed and educated population so you can see the threats that are coming, not just by way of a battlefield, not just by way of a physical threat, a physical takeover, an attack on the country, but also the more subtle takeovers that occur, the cultural shifts, the cultural demises that ultimately lead America, land of the free, down a path of America, land of the progressives, down a path of America, land of the socialists, down a path of America, land of the communists. They're all one and the same. Their, their end goal is the same. It's a complete clampdown on individual liberties, and it's a complete hostility toward the notion of God-given individual rights. Because in a communist country, remember, there is no room for God. There is only room for the state. How China is taking control of Hollywood, the Heritage Institute wrote. The intersection of the free market and Chinese, Chinese censorship in Hollywood and what that means for our culture. You've heard about China's influence in Hollywood. It's not it's not insignificant. The Chinese Communist Party has been actively and successfully influencing the cast, the script, the story plot, the setting of many of America's movies. And America goes along with it because of, just like the NBA went along with it, because of money financial interests, financial interests of a few, selling America's liberty for a buck. And either Americans don't care about it because they want cheap products or they just care about the economy chugging along and their 401k and retirement funds and, and so forth being healthy and, and flourishing, or they don't know about it. Again, freedom isn't free. It requires an educated population. It requires citizens who understand the real threats to America. And the threats take many different forms. Not all of them are military takeovers. Some of them, a lot of them, the most successful ones of them, as a matter of fact, are the cultural ones, are the ones that creep into the citizens' minds and hearts and change from within. Because a military takeover, it leaves a lot of, it leaves, it leaves citizens with the quest to take back what they lost, right? They will rise up and fight back eventually one day. But if you take over an individual's heart and mind and make them buy in to your propaganda, make them believe in your communism, make them a part of your cause, make them in fact worship the cause, they won't even, it won't even dawn on them to rise up and fight back because they'll be part of the system. 
they'll be willing participants in their own enslavement. He gazed up at the enormous face. Anybody know what I'm quoting from there? 1984 by George Orwell. Here's the spoiler alert. If you haven't read that, and if you've gone to school any time in the last couple decades in public school, you probably haven't read that. But my first time reading it was in public school because public school used to teach these, these themes and ideas about freedom. So the main character, main character Winston, he gazed up at the enormous face. This is after he was tortured. This is after he sold out his love to government. This is after, after he was tortured and beaten down and browbeaten. After he was brought into the inner sanctums of Big Brother's torture rooms. After he was broken. He gazed up at the enormous face. Forty years it had taken him to learn what kind of smile was hidden beneath the dark mustache. O cruel, needless misunderstanding, O stubborn, self-willed exile from the loving breast. Two gin-scented tears trickled down the sides of his nose. But it was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. That is the ultimate takeover. That is the ultimate takeover of an individual, of a country, of freedom. And that is the real threat that America faces. Freedom is not free. Yes, arm yourself with your Second Amendment. Feel secure knowing that in this country you still have the right to defend yourself with a firearm, with a gun. But know this, that is not the real threat. That's a threat that you can just shoot. That's a threat that's open. The real threat is the threat that is underneath the surface, that is coming quietly in the night, stealing the hearts and minds of our nation's youth and turning them away from the great idea of America, of God-given individualism, individual rights, and toward the collective evils of communism and globalism. That's the real threat. Freedom isn't free. You have to teach your kids. You have to educate yourself first. You have to teach your kids. June 4th, 1989, that is a clear picture of what China is about. And now, in America, seeping quietly into our soil, into our culture, into our schools, into our economies, is that very thing. Think about it. Think about it. And do something. God bless America. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it.